Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the spotlight session on uh, sustainable geothermal development. My name's uh, Daniel Miller, Senior Energy Specialist um, based in Jakarta, the Indonesian resident mission. And so I'll be moderating this session today. So many of you may have attended uh, sessions on solar and wind and, and hydro. So um, geothermal has the advantage of being able to deliver 24 seven baseload uh, renewable electricity, unlike these other technologies. Uh, so, uh, but there's, there's a number of challenges um, associated with developing geothermal energy. And today we have an experienced uh, lineup of geothermal professionals to discuss some of those potential solutions to those challenges. Uh, before I int introduce the speakers, I'd like to call on Keiju, uh, Director of uh, Energy, Southeast Asia and the Pacific, uh, to uh, provide the opening remarks. Thanks. Uh, good, good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished you know, uh, speakers. Um, it's, um, it's, it's an area which has uh, not been so highlighted um, in, the, you know, in, in the time of uh, energy transition because many are focusing on um, you know, solar PV and winds. But as Daniel alluded, uh, you know, it's, it's really an important renewable energy to complement and then to promote, you know, other type of uh, renewable energy. Uh, just like to highlight a few things, you know, um, one, uh, we have um, updated our energy policy uh, in 2021. And then uh, among other things, you know, renewable energy, you know, re you know is an important one and geothermal is uh, um, recognized uh, quite clearly, you know, uh, important source of uh, power supply uh, to go through the energy transition. So. Uh, for us, it's, it's very important, especially for our team, uh, which manages um, uh, the Southeast and the Pacific uh, portfolio. Uh, geothermal is very important. Look at the Indonesia and the Philippines, you know, large potential, you know, uh, still there. And then um, among, you know, other Asian Pacific, you know, these are the two countries that we, we, we uh, have some transaction already. And then look forward to, um, you know, continue working more intensively in these two countries, especially. Um, we do um, have a, a various product and solutions. Um, we work on a public sector with a utility and uh, with a state-owned enterprise, but also on a, uh, with the private sector for financing. We do also offer uh, um, the uh, transaction advisory for um, any private sector investments to come in. Uh, we do have a technical assistance, uh, which helps um, the government and the utilities and then a uh, and uh, to uh, prepare projects, and then uh, also to improve the, you know, to to develop the capacity. Another important part I want to highlight is, is that um, um, this is uh, a technology not just for the um, uh, power generation, but for you know heating, and it has a different, you know, various application. Uh, so uh, this is something that we shouldn't be forgotten. Another thing is the byproducts with the geothermal. Uh, there's a brine, uh, you know, associated with this, and then, uh, you know, for some, some cases, uh, we have a um, um, byproduct including, uh, you know, silica lithium and then strontium and rare earth elements, and and then uh, these will be uh, very useful and important for uh, further developing the renewable energy industry. Um, so. Um, the last point I want to um, highlight is that um, uh, we need to be um, looking at more targeted approach and, and then identify the challenges you know, face. And then uh, hopefully we can share you know, uh, ideas and then uh, the real example that we have uh, um, so, so that uh, we can learn from each other. So all the best for the discussion. I have to apologize, I have to leave after this uh, opening, but then I, I will leave it to the good hands of uh, in Daniel. Uh, to, to uh, moderate and lead the session. Thank you very much.
Uh, yeah, thank you, Keju, for, for setting the scene and sort of highlighting some of those um, ad, sort of added benefits of uh, geothermal development. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, the, the first speaker. <laughs> well, the first speaker, uh, Park Ellen, uh, Director of uh, Business Development and Exploration at uh, GeoDepa. So ADB has been, had been working closely with GeoDepa to develop their geothermal resources over the last five years. So I'd like to welcome him to the stage. Thanks. Thanks, Pa Daniel. Um, I'm from GeoDepa. Jakarta. So I like to share some of the experience and lesson learned and how to uh, overcome the challenges in uh, Jodipa, Indonesia. Can I have the. So most of you haven't heard about Jodipa. Who the heck is Jodipa, by the way? <laughs> it is the energy company belong to the Indonesian. Uh, it is said between the PLN as the uh, buyer, as well as the Ministry of Finance. So that's how GeoDepa set. Our job is mainly to de-risking and de accelerating the geothermal uh, project and development. So that's how GeoDepa set up since 2002. And uh, on our hands, we do have 1.2 gigawatts of uh, power concessions. And until today, we only develop 120 megawatts and on our hands as well we're trying to develop another 600 465 megawatts on the next uh, 2033 as you mentioned just now in geotherm we're not only talking about electricity but we're also trying to expand the business based on the brine that came out from the wells to extract the potential business from extracting the minerals so like silica lithium etc so in Indonesia, as of today, we only have 2.4 gigawatts installed capacity in geothermal, which compared to the plan, seven gigawatts, like far behind. And there's many reasons on that. So that we have to accelerate the process. Even though we accelerate the process, I don't think we can achieve seven megawatts by next year. There's a lot of uh, development need to be done and a lot of process need to be accelerated as well. However, the drivers are, as we know, in geotherm, a lot of things need to be taken care of, such as financial, uh, exploration risk, social, environmental, land and forestry issue, as well as commercials. Government have a lot of initiatives, such as uh, revising regulations, uh, the providing the grant, providing the grants for exploration. However, it's not enough yet. We still have to do a lot of things to further enhance the process and do some breakthrough in order to accelerate this process. Uh, what we want to have is actually to meet these uh, two area, which is first on the hand, on the right side is the acceleration of renewable energy, which is, seems to be still expensive. On the other side, you also want to have cheap and affordable energy, and which is also uh, contradict with each other. If we do geothermal business as is, it will still be on the right side, which is expensive. We have to do some other things on geothermal business to make it affordable, faster, as well as a low risk for others investors to chip in their investment. So in order to do that, so we have to do a lot of things. As the developer, we have to collaborate with others, uh, parties, all the stakeholders, such as the government, uh, public sectors, uh, NGO, local societies, academia, as well as the uh, off taker. So we as Geodipa, we have to do fast developments, uh, lower the cost, lower the risk, as well as the pick out some uh, opportunities on how to enhance our revenue, not only based on electric selling, but from some, some other things. So we have initiatives to enhance our revenue stream from one single revenue stream as uh, selling the electricity, we want to have some other business based on the brine that came up from the wells by extracting the lithium, silica, as well as for uh, direct use and binary power plants. And on top of that, we may have the extra revenue from renewable energy certificates, as well as the carbon credits. 
So I'll bring you the one case of uh, DING2 Patuhatu development, which is currently in uh, running. It's not being finished yet. We just complete drilling for uh, two times 55 megawatts in Dieng and Patuha, which is in Java Islands, one in Central Java, another one in West Java. We complete the drilling. We are now in the process of doing EPC. You may ask question, why don't you drill and develop EPC at the same time? We, we cut the time. So that's another challenge that we cannot uh, afford to uh, process it uh, sequentially. So the output from this uh, DN2 Patuha 2, what we expect is to double up the capacity by 2027. And uh, we also increase our organizational capabilities. We also improve the community development around this area. There are a lot of challenges since we kick off the project 2019. Uh, I think ADB was there to help us to initiate this project and a lot of challenges such as COVID coming up on 2020. Um, drilling process as well and our people we developed this uh, company 20, 20, 20, 2002 and we haven't do any drilling until 2021 so that's like 20 years of gap of drilling so our expertise was have to rebuild again from developing recruiting training certifications for all personnel that takes uh, some time as well and the project readiness, such as land process, approval, this was come into the picture when we do it. So that's a lot of things also become the hurdle and become the, uh, it's not so stopper, but challenges that we have to overcome. So we have a lot of lesson learned from this, including the drilling process, lesson learned from the challenges from the subsurface reservoir, et cetera. And most of the thing is, uh, government have the policy at that time that we have to work at home most of the time but to drill a well we cannot drill from home we have to bring the rigs to location we have to mobilize people on the location geologists dealers everything have to be done physically but at the same time the limitation of people to work that become our hurdles so uh, on top of that uh, hurdles we are keep running uh, even though a bit delay on the project but still it is acceptable in my eyes that uh, we still have to give a positive impact to the environment society, both in being in Patuha, we collaborate with local business partners, we develop a local society, we increase our organizational capabilities as well, based on that two projects. So on the upcoming project, I think we will do a lot of better jobs because we have learned the process from being to Patuha too. And the way forward that we're looking at based on this project that we have is, we have to strengthen our project management capabilities. Uh, Geodipa doesn't have drilling people, for example. We recruit drilling people. We have to certify them, training them, learn from others' company, benchmarking, a lot of things that we have to do. And other things also enhancement the procurement process because our process uh, follow with uh, ADB process, follow the regulation of the companies, regulation of the authorities. We have to meet all the requirements that how we have to blend everything together in order to make the project running. And uh, addressing subsurface challenge, that's another thing. For example, in our initial plan, drilling in Dieng area is supposed to be more difficult compared to Patuha areas. So in Dieng area, we plan one well 60 days. In Patuha, we plan only 45 days to complete. But in reality, in Dieng area, we complete uh, less than 45 days, some of them also less than one month. In Patuha, most of the wells complete uh, more than what we plan. So in Dieng, we uh, save the budget. In Patuha, we overspend. However, based on this two spending and then uh, saving here and there, we still make uh, the time as well as the budget for both Dieng and Patuha. So based on the lesson learned, I think we may now, now what the risks on the subsurface what expertise need to be done, what technology need to be in place, as well as collaboration between all the divisions in drilling, procurements, safeguards, uh, safety, and uh, regulators. So another thing is the, uh, the learning that we have a lot of things that we can optimize in co collaboration with ADBs, such as the technical assistance, such as the um, uh, advisor, such as uh, involving them in studying, involving them in guidelining the process to align between government regulations, 
GeoDepa internal process as well as ADB uh, process. So all those things need to be uh, worked out and to make things happen. So with that, I uh, close this presentation. I would like to have any question later on our discussion or comments or suggestions perhaps about better futures. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Park Ellen, for those uh, those comments and highlighting that the secondary streams of geothermal um, uh, electricity will be quite important in the in the future. I think they call this beyond electricity, and in, uh, in Indonesia is the slogan for for that. So now I'd like to um, introduce the second speaker, uh, Rainer Harkon, from the OAC Geothermal Energy Management Division of uh, the Department of Energy in the Philippines. Um, I'd like to welcome him to the stage. Thanks. All right. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Rainer Halcon. I'm the officer in charge of the Geothermal Energy Management Division under the Renewable Energy Management Bureau of the Department of Energy. So I am excited to be with you today to, um, to, dis to discuss with you the lessons learned, the way forward, and the challenges that we have encountered in geothermal development here in the Philippines. <clears throat> so on this slide, we can see that the installed and generation power mix of the Philippines as of 2023. So among the RE technologies, geothermal plays its significant role in our both mixes and installed and power generation mix, um, contributing 6.70% in the installed capacity and at least 9.20% in geothermal generation. On this slide, we can see that um, the country has at least 26 geothermal service contracts or operating contracts as of May 2024. Most of these projects are under pre-development stage or exploration stage in your, um, in your understanding maybe. And at least we have 12 service contracts or operating contracts um, that currently operates the seven geothermal fields that we have here. Um, that's at least 1,952 megawatts in installed capacity. So all our geothermal service contracts here are scattered all over the Philippines, as you can see in this inset map. So more on a historical performance. You can see here the installed um, performance and generation um, we have um, registered from our geothermal development starting in 1970s up to 2023. The most notable from this figure is the first wave and second wave of growth that we have seen in our geothermal development um, that, that happened between 1980s and 1990s era. On the x-axis, you can see here the notable um, policies and laws that supported geothermal development. These are the PD Presidential Decree 1442, the Build Operate Transfer Law, the EPIRA Law or the 9136, and the Renewable Energy Law of 9, or 9513. 9513. So from this performance, we have recorded or we have at least seen that the Philippines is now the third geothermal producing country in the, in the world next to the United States and Indonesia. We were second um, from some time in this period until G Indonesia woke up and started developing, unlocking their geothermal potential. So in this inset box, you can see that I have highlighted the period from which geothermal, um, the performance of geothermal development um, 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 sorry, um, performed under the Renewable Energy Law, which aims to accelerate the exploration and development of RE resources, achieve energy self-reliance, and mitigate the climate change. But it is notable that we haven't seen the third wave of expansion that we are expecting from geothermal development since the RE Law was enacted in 2008. 
Instead, what we have seen is that we have, uh, there were several decommissioning of power plants because since the privatization of those government assets in the APRA law, um, these power plants were decommissioned because of uncommercial um, reasons or economic reasons that's no longer feasible to maintain those power plants. Um, we have also seen um, small um, installations addition, capacity additions from rehabilitation of power plants, new power plants, and power plant optimization projects. So what's, what's maybe the reason on this sluggish development? We can see here the development pathway our developers encounters in, in developing geothermal. So in each, in each stage, our developers encounters unique challenges. So from our records, we have seen they, are, they have encountered concession procedures. The area is within protected area, within ancestral domains, and there are very unharmonized acquisition of permits and clearances from different government agencies. We, all, we have also seen challenges in resource itself or the permeability, a small development area, fluid, financing, especially for drilling, and of course, challenges in transmission connection. From our records, we have seen at least 20 service contracts that still um, undergoing various fields, um, field access, conducting their um, scientific assessments. We have also recorded two service contracts and still um, in their test drilling or exploration drilling. And we have at least seen two service contracts um, that is already developing their steam field. So we can see that most of our projects here are uh, within this period of high risk and relatively high cost of development of geothermal resources. So in terms of policy support, we have seen that the RE law has provided or addresses the challenges in procedural um, challenges like the energy virtual one-stop shop where our administration from application of service contracts up to the commercialization stage is provided online. We have also provided an omnibus guidelines that provides the streamlined processing of permits and clearances within the Department of Energy. We have also allowed um, for 100% foreign ownership for geothermal development. And of course, we, the Department of Energy conducts its own resource assessment to further de-risk our geothermal resources. On the other side of the spectrum, we have seen that our policy provides market support by creating policies on preferential dispatch, renewable for foliage standards, green energy, green, green energy option, and some other non-fiscal incentives that we have provided. But the big question is that the middle part of our development pathway remains um, a bit of a challenge, right? So as you have recalled in my previous slide that most of our projects are stuck within this region. So with the help of our friends from ADB, we are working on creating this de-risking facility. So, the notable players here are, of course, the an, an independent management team composed of technical experts, financial and legal experts, environment and social experts. We, ha we also have independent auditors, peer reviewers, the government of the Philippines and its partners, um, international financing institution will serve as the overhead oversight um, oversight board in approving such um, funding. So this will especially work, um, the de-risking facility will address the exploration drilling up to production drilling by creating or by providing a 50% 50 um, cost-sharing um, cost scheme for funding exploration drilling. So our expected outcomes is for this at least uh, this 481 megawatt greenfield investment is limited to 29 
um, geothermal areas that we have provided and identified with ADB to serve as our testing areas. And the expected outcomes will at least catalyze private investment, avoid several fuel um, costs, carbon dioxide, estimated gen generated jobs will be given. And of course, the DOE will have another set of newly gathered geothermal data under this de-risking project. So for the development outlook, before the RE law, we only have two developers. These are EDC and PGPC. And um, they are developing at least or sustainably operating our six geothermal fields before the RE law. And after the RE law was, was enacted, we have registered at least 21 new geothermal developers. And we have added one new geothermal field for commercial operations. But with the ongoing or with the current setup of policies that the RE law is providing, and with the expected uptick in investment because of this facility, uh, the risking facility will give. Um, we are very optimistic at the Department of Energy that this remaining geothermal fields you can see here in our map and the remaining 2,000 at least um, potential capacities will be developed in the foreseeable future. So that ends my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Raina, for um, going through that de-risking uh, mechanism. Hopefully, we'll see a, a third wave of geothermal development in, in the Philippines, and they will be competing with uh, Indonesia for that second spot. <laughs> Um, uh, so, and, and just to let you know, there'll be time for questions at the end of the session. So uh, please save your questions to the end and, and we can direct them at the, uh, the speakers then. So I'd like to introduce the next speaker, sort of uh, Phil uh, Laurie, who's um, uh, from New Zealand to, to share his experiences. So Phil's been working closely as a technical advisor for both ADB and supporting GeoDeeper in their development. And he'll give a sort of a global perspective on uh, on geothermal challenges and and the potential solutions. So thanks. Phil. Thanks, Daniel. Um, Raina, just to give you an idea how old I what I am, um, I was involved in both the first wave and the second wave in uh, in, in Philippines, <laughs> and I look forward to the third wave as well. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, my presentation today, um, I'm going to give a, uh, a brief history of New Zealand's power industry and regulatory framework, um, the role of geothermal in the overall generation mix. I'll talk a bit about um, some of the partnering relationships and then talk about geothermal becoming a net zero uh, greenhouse gas emitter. Um, in... The New Zealand electricity industry has changed a lot since the 1980s. Um, there's been a market-based dispatch and pricing model that's been introduced. And with the exception of the high voltage transmission assets, all of the generating assets have been transferred into private ownership. Each major generation company holds a mix of generation types and holds a retail customer base that pretty much matches it's, uh, it's generating capacity. Retail customers can move between uh, retailers and they will change based on um, the pricing model that best suits them as a customer. New Zealand operates an electricity market where generators submit offers to cover future-based 30-minute trading periods. And the system operator ranks the offers and selects the lowest price combination that satisfies demand. The highest price bid accepted by the operator to meet the demand sets the price for each trading period and all power generated in that trading period is traded at that price. The electricity spot price varies substantially across trading periods depending on supply and demand reflecting for example higher prices during low hydro lake levels 
or differences in demand between summer and winter. Uh, 50 years ago, the annual power usage in New Zealand is about half its current level, with hydro operating about 75%, and the balance coming from a range of sources, including geothermal, oil, coal, and gas. Electricity usage has remained relatively constant at about 43,000 gigawatt hours per year for the last 20 years. But over that period, hydro has typically gener uh, contributed about 55 to 60%. But New Zealand is increasingly becoming reliant on renewable electricity generation being two thirds about 20 years ago to more than 85% now. While hydro has stayed relatively constant, the two decades have seen increases in other renewables, including wind, solar, and geothermal. So geothermal has grown over that period from 6% to being almost 20% of the generating mix now. The bulk of the high temperature geothermal resources in New Zealand are located in northeast to southwest band in the center of the North Island. The Wairaki project was developed by the New Zealand government and came into operation in the mid 1950s. The wells produced a mixture of steam and of geothermal water and the water contains a range of dissolved minerals in a saline solution similar to seawater. The process was simply to separate the steam and geothermal water under pressure with the steam being passed through machines very similar to low pressure turbines of conventional thermal power stations. Steam produced is relatively free of minerals that might scale or corrode the turbines with these staying in the liquid phase. In the early days, the separated water was discharged into the adjacent Waikato River. Over time, detrimental effects, including environmental pollution, ground subsidence and loss of production due to uh, cold water inflows into the reservoir became apparent and in line with practices elsewhere in the world, geothermal water was re-injected back into the reservoir, reducing the environmental impacts, slowing the rates of subsidence and enabling reservoir pressures to stabilize. With Wairaki's success, the government continued with exploration of geothermal resources. And when the power industry was privatized, the development rights for the geothermal assets were transferred to the private power companies. Under New Zealand law, geothermal resources are managed under what's called the Resource Management Act, which is administered by 11 regional councils that cover New Zealand. Fundamentally, the purpose of the Act is to ensure that activities will not harm neighbours or communities or damage the air, water, soil or ecosystems that we and future generations need to survive. The fundamental tenet of the, law, of the Act is that any activity should be considered less than minor. So any landowner is able to develop geothermal resources under their property within the constraints of the Act. Geothermal heat has been used for many years in direct heating, including domestic, commercial, industrial, and agricultural applications. A developer must apply to council for a resource consent before any project can proceed. And the application needs to be supported by studies considering the benefits and the effects of the proposed development. Resource consents will often be very specific in setting requirements for development and also for operation and monitoring. An example is the Natamariki geothermal development. The project is located on the same reservoir that feeds the Auraki Karako geothermal area in central North Island, which is of significant cultural importance and, and is a major tourism attraction in the region. The resource consent is about 30 pages long. It's based on sustain sustainable management principles and sets out performance standards. It sets the consent duration and the maximum fluid that you can take from the reservoir every day. The resource consent does not set the power output that the development will, um, will deliver. It requires the owner to report on the operating performance to council and it sets up independent peer review panels to review reports from the owner and the council can modify the consent if the performance standards are not being met. So in the Nā Tamariki 
project um, proceeded is based on 100% reinjection of fluid produced to minimise the risk of reservoir pressure drawdown that might contravene the consent. The station uses binary technology, has a nameplate rating of 82 megawatts, and generates about 700 gigawatt hours per year. Monitoring of any impacts on the surrounding geothermal features continues as part of the consent conditions. Settlements of Treaty of Waitangi claims with local Māori has seen land ownership transferred back from government to local iwi. Geothermal resources have been found on some of these properties, and Māori owners have developed the resources, sometimes in partnership with one of the major, major generators, but in a number of cases, also including a range of other uses. As one of a number of successful examples, the Turapaki Trust has, it owns the land around the Mokai power station about 30 kilometres uh, north of Taupo. The resource has been developed over a number of years, now operating a binary plow, power plant of about 100 megawatts in partnership with Mercury Energy, and also supplying geothermal steam to a nearby dairy factory and an export flower, flower farm, as well as supplying green electricity to a demonstration hydrogen plant built adjacent to the station. As well as the obvious employment benefits, revenues from the operations flow back to the local owners, enabling further investment, benefiting the entire local community. The consenting model, which sets limits of fluid extraction, has led developers to adopt advanced technologies, including double and triple flash steam turbines and binary plants to maximize thermal efficiency and plant configurations that improve reliability to maximize revenues. Geothermal power plants produce a small amount of non-condensable gases, comprising mainly carbon dioxide, small amounts of hydrogen sulfide, traces of other gases. Historically, the gas has been discharged to atmosphere, meaning geothermal has always been a small net contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Recent developments have enabled the gases to be captured and reinjected re injected into the reservoir, along with separated geothermal water and condensate. And as well as enhancing reservoir performance, this makes these plants net zero emitters of greenhouse gases, as well as zero surface discharge of fluids. So in summary, the New Zealand geothermal industry has continued to develop since it was established about 70 years ago. The industry is becoming a significant contributor to the re renewable energy sector and new plants continue to be built and planned. Some of the features that have enabled the industry to establish and grow have been high risk and high cost of early prospecting the exploration drilling has been carried out under government funding. The bulk of the actual developments are in private ownership and commercially funded. There's a strong commitment to renewable energy supported by an active carbon market. The major generators in New Zealand own a range of generating plant, including baseload, peaking, renewable and conventional technologies. And the market model enables generators to make market investment decisions in, a, in an open market that offers fair returns. The resource consenting model encourages developers to establish state-of-the-art technologies. And lastly, partnering with local iwi enables sustainable development that manages local resources and enables returns to all interested parties. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Phil, for uh, sharing those insights from New Zealand and how they sustainably manage the, the resource there and some of those examples on direct use. I, did you see the big prawn that was up there, um, the prawn farm that they were they're growing in New Zealand? Um, so now I'd like to invite to the stage Ms. Hazel Khan. Um, she's the Head of Business Development, Control and Support, Energy Development Corporation, the Philippines, uh, to share her insights as a private sector developer. Hi, um, good morning, everyone. So I'm Hazel Kuan from Energy Development Corporation, or EDC. Um, 
So for um, this brief geothermal spotlight session, we were asked to uh, share insights uh, on the Philippine geothermal um, energy development, the challenges, um, at least from a local, uh, I believe, a local uh, developer perspective. So, um, where do I point? Yep. Um, so maybe I'll start first by introducing our company. Um, Energy Development Corporation is um, the largest vertically integrated geothermal company globally, having close to 1,200 uh, megawatt of total installed uh, geothermal capacity. Um, we have uh, started um, geothermal development back in the 1970s to 1980s as PNOCEDC, um, that's Philippine National Oil Company. Uh, back then, it was a government-owned corporation until it was uh, privatized um, in 2000, late 2007. So um, essentially, EDC has been exploring and developing geothermal energy for nearly 50 years. And it has been instrumental in helping the Philippines become the third largest geothermal producer in the world. Um, as we grow our, as we EDC um, grow our geothermal portfolio, um, we've also um, diversified into wind and solar. So as of end of last year, 2023, um, our group has a total current installed capacity of RE capacity of 1,463, um, 1,169 of which um, is in um, geothermal, uh, 150 is in uh, wind, um, roughly 12 uh, megawatt is in solar and 132 in hydro. Um, so for um, this particular slide, I wouldn't go into the details of history. Um, it's a good thing, Sir Rainier, um, presented before me. Um, I will take the liberty to refer to your slides. But um, um, for this particular slide, the, the, intent is to, the intent is to show the growth in installed geothermal capacity in the Philippines. Um, as we can see here, um, there are trends of rapid growth um, around 1978, but we can also see um, some period of stagnation, um, which required uh, government uh, reforms and intervention. Uh, to get another boost of uh, growth towards around um, 1992. But overall, this picture would show how the Philippine geothermal industry has um, grown and uh, paved the way for RE in the country. And again, um, just to uh, proudly reiterate, we're the third largest, um, used to be second before, but uh, third now um, um, following US, US and Indonesia. But um, uh, we are here, um, where we are now, but uh, not without uh, challenges. And as you have, as you would have, as you would have noticed in the last chart, in fact, um, the geothermal expansion in the Philippines have actually slowed down uh, in the past decade as uh, developers continue to face um, challenges, interrelated challenges and risk across the various stages of geothermal development. Um, so at this point, I, I'm showing the list of the key challenges, um, but I, I'm sure uh, most, if not all, of these are not new to us, but um, these are the key um, risks that we would like to emphasize, uh, at least from a local developer perspective. Uh, we start with um, the uh, we, we start with proving the resource exploration risk. Uh, that's the uh, wide lack knowledge hurdle or obstacle that every um, developer faces. Um, under the uh, Philippine Geother um, Geothermal Service Contract the local developer assumes or takes all of the risk um, in, in developing a geothermal project, um, proving the resource um, to social, political, security, um, commercial, and even the market risk. And um, added to that is the high um, cost of drilling, which um, uh, constitute uh, at least 30%, um, could go up, up, up to 40% of um, total uh, geothermal development cost and compounded um, this this um, exploration risk and high cost of drilling uh, challenges um, a developers uh, at, uh, added to the challenge that developers face in terms of exploration and proving the uh, um, getting the resource confirmation alone um, and just to note for for this two um, exploration and drilling would uh, could normally would normally take at least five years and um, would require initial investment of uh, at least twenty million uh, USD. And uh, we know that um, given that um, geothermal industry does not enjoy the uh, guaranteed rate in fit system, um, we know that um, these two 
um, really are the um, key reasons why you haven't seen any um, greenfield development over the past years. Um, the third one, financing, uh, relates to the first two. Um, unlike other countries that have implemented fiscal incentives for a geothermal project um, during its early exploration or uh, exploration or drilling stage, uh, maybe we can say that here in the Philippines, we have limited, if none, uh, if uh, no um, risk sharing options or lack of mitigation options. A majority of lenders uh, fund after resource confirmation. And um, if there are um, any known grants, um, these are mainly focused on feasibility development studies and uh, resource assessments. Now, um, just, just zooming out, um, and um, another bucket here, the part one, is long-term development timeline, wherein we, we covers um, one of the most uh, problem that um, local developers face, the lengthy process of securing permits and licenses, and um, challenges in, in terms of connecting to the grid. Um, maybe just, just to point, um, just, just one key challenge in terms of uh, uh, processing the permits, um, given the, the location of our geothermal sites are mainly on the mountainous areas, um, remote areas, um, we, we can't help but um, um, have exposure or interfere with uh, ancestral lands, which Senior have um, late, um, passed, passed through in his slide. Um, getting the, the um, in the Philippines, it's really crucial to get the respect of these indigenous people and um, in most likelihood, their timeline um, um, is um, something that be beyond the local developer's control. So it really uh, it's up the work program of uh, uh, work program of the developers. Um, in terms of the connection, we, we know that the topography of our country makes it really difficult and challenging and expensive uh, in terms of uh, transmission um, energy. Um, uh, distribution. So uh, lastly, just to maybe just um, in terms of um, just noting on the government policies, we know that in the past, um, changes in administration have uh, led to some sway or change in uh, mandate in terms of the renewable energy mix. But um, moving forward, um, with all of this, uh, we, we can say that um, geothermal um, is challenged to earn its right to grow. But I think with our continuous collaboration with our um, government and regulatory partners and stakeholders, um, we've seen these um, key developments, um, which um, we, we can look forward to. End-to-end um, -end policy um, support or regulatory platforms, including government um, fiscal incentives, could and uh, can definitely provide a spark in terms of enticing more geothermal developers um, as um, uh, good thing, Sir, Sir Rainier, um, included this drilling risk mitigation fund, definitely, um, definitely a good um, catalyze um, in terms of uh, uh, ca to catalyze the private funding for development. Um, permitting and access to the grid, um, one notable here is um, we, wel we welcome DOE's initiative to oper operationalize EVOS. Uh, energy uh, virtual one-stop shop. It has improved um, a lot of the permitting challenges that we had, um, but we look forward to um, integrating more uh, improvement into the system such that we're still able to uh, address some remaining challenges in terms of permitting. And uh, lastly, market support mechanism. Again, given the exploration uh, risk and uh, not to mention the market and uh, market risk that developers face. Um, we, we really need uh, market support uh, in terms of tariff for, from, from the government. And a good thing to note here is that early this year, um, the OE uh, included uh, in its third round of green energy um, auction program, the non-fit RE technologies um, that's including our very own geothermal um, along with uh, hydro, which we um, local developers are so much looking forward to. Um, that's it. Um, I guess overall what we can say is that um, harnessing uh, geothermal energy is very challenging. But again, um, with, with, with focus uh, on our goals and with our continuous collaboration with our um, government partners, regulatory partners, and along with other stakeholders, 
um, here, um, we can continue to push forward. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Hazel, for uh, highlighting some of those challenges uh, in the Philippine market. And they're sort of broadly uh, aligned with our experiences in Indonesia as well with those lengthy sort of licensing um, um, and permitting sort of process that the remote areas, sometime in prote protected forests and uh, the high upfront costs of that uh, exploration. So we're now on to our last speaker. Um, we're gonna change track a little bit uh, from generation to, to something different. I'm going to introduce uh, Tuva Darva from the AD, she's an ADB energy officer uh, from the Mongolian resident mission and she's going to share her experiences with sort of decarbonizing district heating systems with uh, and geothermal heating with technologies in Mongolia. Can we welcome her to the stage? Thanks a lot. Hello, everyone. Uh, very happy to see you all. Okay, let me start my presentation. So I will be talking about what ADB is doing in Mongolia in terms of geothermal heating. So it's a very high level of introduction, uh, just introducing what we are doing. So uh, as you might be aware, Mongolia is one of the coldest country in the world. According to World Atlas, it's the third coldest country in the world. And the capital city, is, uh, Ulaanbaatar, is actually the, the coldest capital city in the world. So uh, the coldest month is uh, January, uh, when uh, average high temperature is minus 15 and the average uh, minimum temperature is somewhere around minus 25. So it's very cold and uh, that's why um, heat is really important. So in household energy consumption mix, heat is shares, uh, heat shares 70% while electricity shares only 30%. So uh, due to the abundant resource of coal, uh, we use heat, uh, coal for heating. So there are the major technologies are combined heat and uh, power plants, heat only boilers and uh, uh, just regular household stoves. So while uh, this uh, heat only boiler and uh, uh, stoves are low uh, with low efficiency. We have so much air pollution problem during winter times. So you can see the air pollution is quite visible during uh, winter time. Uh, when there is no wind, it stays and it's really uh, harming to the environment and people's health. So this slide is showing how the rural town and SOM heating looks like. Uh, the typical SOMs are heated by heat only boilers, uh, which bur burns coal. So it's uh, really environmentally uh, polluting and it's hard to work inside. So uh, yeah, uh, this uh, slide is also showing us uh, kind of a uh, some uh, heating network. It's uh, maybe it's a less than a district heating, but it's kind of a um, network for clusters of building. So, so um, while there are uh, technologies available worldwide for clean heating, um, Mongolia has a very small experience, and uh, that's why it was uh, the, uh, uh, there was a a lot, despite these uh, technology options, uh, potential renewable energy investment was uh, low in the past. Um, yeah, as I mentioned uh, before, air pollution is a very difficult, uh, it's very challenging problem, but uh, it's even worse in rural areas because they are using just heat only boilers and regular household stoves instead of uh, CHPs. 
So this slide is showing our pro uh, the projects that we are working on. There are three ma uh, main projects. Uh, the first one is upscaling renewable energy sector project. It became effective in 2019. There are five sub projects uh, under that uh, sector project uh, related with the ground heat. Those are using shallow ground source heat pump uh, technology for heating of public buildings, hospital, uh, such as hospital, kindergarten, and schools. The second one is uh, in a, a, a project being implemented in uh, health sector, and there are, uh, are also three sub projects which are utilizing ground source heat pump systems. Both of these technologies and the, both of these projects are financed, uh, grant financed. The first one is uh, uh, got financed from Strategic Climate Fund, and uh, this he uh, health sector one uh, got grant from uh, JFJCM grant. The third one is a transaction technical assistant assistance. Um, the name is supporting renewable energy development project under which there is uh, one sub project uh, which is using um, medium depth ground source heat pump system for uh, kind of a small, very small district heating system. The target approval of this project is quarter four of this year. So still it's under processing. So from this slide, you can see the geographical locations of the uh, three projects and the sub project. As you can see, most of them are uh, uh, far from the capital city, Ulaanbaatar. Uh, uh, so it aligns with the, uh, some purpose of uh, improving the rural condition uh, and uh, uh, living uh, environment. So this is just an example uh, of a system which has been installed under upscaling renewable energy sector project. This is a kindergarten uh, which used a ground source heat pump system. Uh, uh, combined with solar thermal collectors. So this uh, slide focused on the transaction technical assistant, uh, which I mentioned before. Uh, under that transaction technical assistance, there is a preliminary feasibility study conducted, which focused on uh, one location uh, in a rural town, what we call SOM. Uh, even if it's a one location, uh, it can be relevant to other rural towns and zones because uh, all the zones share similar characteristics. So uh, when this project succeeds, it means that it can be replicated in other zones. So basically, uh, the, uh, this um, technical assistance is focused on uh, introducing medium depth ground source heat pump system in Harhor and Som, and it will replace existing heat only boiler. And the total investment cost is 7.5 million, uh, which also includes 1.5 megawatt solar PV to reach uh, higher emission reduction and to increase the grant portion for this project. So, um, the standard SOM size uh, for this case is uh, uh, the SOM heating, small heating network is supplying heat for 31 buildings with a total volume of 120 uh, cubic meter. Uh, and the energy coverage would be eight, around 84%. A heat pump system will provide 84% of the heating, while the rest will be provided by electric heaters. CO2 emission drop uh, will be around 56, as estimated by our consultants, but it excludes the solar PV part. It will be higher uh, if we also consider solar. So it's economically viable, uh, but uh, it's fin financially uh, uh, not viable, I would say, but, but it's operationally sustainable, which means that there will be cost saving uh, during operation to compare with the pre-existing heat only boiler. So it's operationally su sustainable, uh, uh, but there is some challenges to justify this project in terms of like commercial basis. 
So this uh, table is uh, very interesting. It's focused on the comparison of medium depth ground source heat pump technology with shallow ground source heat pump technology. This table is uh, more focused on the drilling aspects. So for example, with the same capacity of the system with two different technologies. So well depth, uh, total well depth uh, for the, uh, no, Depth for each borehole would be like around 2,000 2, 2, meter for a ground so, uh, medium depth technology, uh, while it will be 240 meter for, for shallow ground uh, heat pump technology. But the total uh, borehole numbers would be of only four for medium depth one, while this will be for around 400 for the other technology. So it means that the medium depth ground source heat pump technology will be more appropriate for clusters of buildings instead of individual. And uh, we see, uh, we hope there will be a great opportunity to utilize this technology for the country. So there is also, I highlighted the drilling cost, total drilling cost. Uh, for the each technology, it's much cheaper for medium depth one. So uh, I'm, uh, this is the last slide of my presentation, and those are the key messages that I would like to uh, deliver. So ATP is working with the government of Mongolia to support its uh, energy transition from conventional coal-based uh, heating to geothermal cleaner heating, both for individual building scale and uh, district heating scale. And Harhorin Som uh, medium depth ground source heat pump system is the flagship project uh, which holds uh, great potential. So thank you for your attention. So thank you for that interesting uh, presentation. Uh, even with sort of a modest investment there, you can see it can make a, a big difference in terms of uh, carbon reductions and uh, improved uh, air quality as well. So uh, now uh, all the presentations are done, so we can open it up to any questions from the audience um, for any of the speakers. <laughs> Is that your microphone? Uh, just uh, state your name, where you're from, uh, what your question is, and who it's for. Thanks. Red one. <laughs> well, uh, you can hear me. <laughs> Seems pretty fun. Is there kind of a, a latest crazy idea who maybe like if we have other CO2 source injected into that system fault will be safety or like you know basically a very early exploration if we can go to that directions or you think if this is crazy then you know we can just forget <laughs> about it i think i think we'll need that um advice thank you okay thank you for those questions so do you want to take the first one rona or hazel <laughs>
<laughs> Got an on, might have an on button. Hi, sir. So I think I I didn't fully capture your question, or but anyway, what I understood from your statements that the Philippine government is always open and welcome to any collaboration within the ASEAN region. And for REMB itself, um, all programs for cooperation or international cooperations in itself um, comes through a different um, group from us, from our planning bureau. And most of the time, such um, collaboration requests um, comes through to them and forwarded to us for further evaluation. So. Maybe if you can maybe give give us some um, program profile, would it be like that? would it be like that? And we can study and discuss further on some details. Thank you. Uh, do you want to add to that, Hazel, or shall we go to uh, Bill to answer the the curly question? <laughs> yeah. Um. Maybe from from my point in which um we'll uh actually coming from my presentation later, I, a while ago, uh, it's really more of um, the funding support. So if we could have uh, concessional loans or kind of financing, um, I, we, know that, uh, uh, we know that the structure may be by, a bit complicated, but I think it's something that we can um, sit on with and um, discuss what would be your uh, concerns and what would be um, an offer that would come from a local de developer perspective. But again, as we have uh, previously highlighted, uh, one key uh, burden that we are really uh, local developers really are facing especially for smaller developers are the financing so if you do not have the initial uh, capital to um, at least take on this initial risk then you wouldn't start to begin with so. and phil address the carbon capture question good to see you Ridwan. <laughs> Um, so really, really interesting question. Um, the um, in each reservoir, I think there's a um, a maximum amount of CO two that can be uh, can be reinjected without because um, what you're trying to do is to make sure that the carbon dioxide dioxide actually goes back into solution in the reservoir, so it actually dissolves back into the into the brine. Um, and the concern has always been in the past that um, you may not actually get all the CO2 to go back into solution, and then you risk um, you know, leakage back to, to surface, what they call phreatic explosions and things like that, which are not good. Um, but the, there's been quite a bit of, uh, bit of development and they've, they've now found that um, uh, it, it can actually be um, captured and re-injected. Um, and it actually has benefits to the reservoir as well, because it, it actually drives the, um, uh, makes the reservoir more acid, which means silica actually stays in solution, doesn't actually scale back out in the reservoir. So the, there is potential. Um, I, I think the challenge that you, that you have is more of a geographical challenge um, because your thermal power plant, unless it's sitting right alongside where, the, where your geothermal resource is, then you've got the issue of how do you actually physically transport the CO2 from one, place, from one location to another. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Daniel. If I if I can just comment a little bit on the um, Rizwan's other other question okay. as well, and I, and I think there's a there's a piece of history here which I think is really really important to recognise. Um, in my presentation, I talked about um, the government involvement in uh, geothermal development and the early re uh, research um, exploration drilling in New Zealand. If you go back and look historically at other places, including Indonesia, including the Philippines, including Kenya, the involvement of either government entities or government entities and or oil companies is actually quite significant. So the, the Indonesian program, for example, was um, supported in the early days by Pertamina, which is the government oil, government oil company, and by um, US oil companies who were invited in and given concessions to work with Pertamina in, in the same way here in the Philippines, it was PNOC and US oil companies that did that. And, and it's because that risk profile at the early stage of these projects is so different 
to the risk profile once you've actually proven the reservoir. Uh, that, um, and I think Daniel and I were talking about it last night, that the problem that any financier has is um, actually lending money for a drilling program when there's no guaranteed return. So you end up having to fund your exploration drilling from equity rather than from debt, um, which of course is much more expensive um, um, funding. Yeah, please. Yeah, if I may add, uh, Ridwan, thanks for the questions. Uh, the person next sitting next to you is our business development from <laughs> Geodiva. So uh, there are a lot of things that we can uh, work out in terms of the risking. That's a big deal that we are uh, having right now because a uh, very rare institution willing to invest on the explorations. That's how in the past 10 years, perhaps the exploration in geothermal pretty much slow. So that's how we have to find out the mechanism on how to de risking expedite the exploration process. And in terms of the utilizing the geothermal for CCUS, I remember I was involved in the first CCUS project in Indonesia. Gundi, if may heard that project, I was involved on that. Really just uh, converting the idle wells to make it the CCUS. We in Jodipa, there are more than 30 wells idles. We can convert that by analyzing that well bone integrity, reservoir situations, and then make sure there's a caps on top of the reservoir, which will not able for the CO2 to leak to the surface back. So we can do that with term and condition apply. So I think we can do that CCUS and geothermal and opportunities for the there is seeing again is there. We can talk more detail on that later on. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay, we've got a question down here. This is a microphone. <laughs> Microphone's coming. Got a Mark Gibson from New Zealand. Thanks for the thanks for the awesome panel. Um, I'd just like to comment something about the CO2 stuff, but there's a question coming. Um, in New Zealand, one of our um, uh, operators is fully re-injecting because we have to, because the operation was going to shut down because of their emissions trading um, scheme tax. So we, they pay a lot of tax in New Zealand on their emissions. Um, and that's an engineering problem, not a reservoir problem, but the reservoir coming to um, the comments that have been made, CO2 re-injection is a real thing, um, and you can put more in, which is exciting. But my question to the panel, and it's... <laughs> It's going to be interesting because Jeff Grant and I from EDC, <laughs> Mark Gibson from GNS, we've, we're part of an Asia Pacific group. We work across the whole of um, Asia as a volunteer organization trying to bring geothermal up in the numbers. Yesterday and the day before, not many of the emissions profiles or the long term benefits of geothermal are shown in this audience in terms of the base load that we provide in terms of electricity, but also the ground source heating and everything. So, my challenge I guess and ask of the panel is think about how you could answer this and it might be rain you probably you'll be aware of this but how do we collectively bring geothermal up in the ranks when you see other renewables in the report when geothermal long term and I'll give wide okay in New Zealand as an example 67 years that power station has been running you know, you think about the emissions in 67 years versus a PV solar panel that's going to get chucked out in five or six years and get outdated. You know, so my, my question is, how can we collectively in the geothermal industry and the geothermal sector and the energy sector get those numbers up to actually show, hey, look, baseload energy providing for housing, for providing for heating, how do we get it up in the numbers? So I don't know who's going to be the best. Maybe, Daniel, you can ask. Well, those guys. I guess we'll throw that open to all of them and they, uh, they can uh, have a go at that one because it's a, a very good question. And yeah, I agree. It's um, you know, the only sort of true 24-7 baseload renewable uh, energy and it doesn't get quite as much as attention as uh, some of the others like solar and uh, wind. So who would like to open? I'll, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> so, so Mark, I think I think you touched on uh, touched on part of it, which is, um, and, and Daniel did as well. The um, the different part of the energy profile where geothermal sits compared with wind or or solar, um, and and the fact that it it is actually baseload generation. And if you if you actually look at um, the number of new hydro projects that have been approved in the last ten years, it's not very many. Um, so you know, because the you know the environmental impacts are 
um, you know, fairly challenging. So I think there is something that geothermal really offers because it is baseload generation. So it's there whether it's um, windy or not windy, whether it's daylight or middle of the night, it's still running. Um, and one of the things I think is really interesting to, the, to see, you know, um, over the last few years in New Zealand, how um, the generating companies are actually retiring their um, thermal generation and moving to, to geothermal, it's base load. You know, they're putting in wind, they're putting in solar and all that sort of stuff, but they still need this other piece sitting down here. And so it's how, how um, you actually differentiate geothermal from other renewable um, energy types it's part of how you actually sell the story of, of how valuable it is in terms of that that energy mix yeah. hi mark thank you for that <laughs> question um to to increase the value um, to increase interest in geothermal development in the philippines we have this national renewable energy program right so where we aim to increase um, RE capacity, our RE in the generation mix by at least 35% by 2030 and 50% by 2040. So we have a lot of numbers to cover. Right now we are at least 22% in RE generation mix. So we really have this um, whole of nature, nation approach and whole of government approach. So on the government side, we are in active coordination with all government agencies to streamline our um, processes and permitting, permitting processes so that our developers will encounter less um, challenges when they go to the ground. So actually, we have, uh, um, we have um, implemented the virtual shop or the online permitting process for all RE projects. Um, we have instituted um, active partnership with the local government units where we introduced a, a energy, local, local energy um, resolution of support. So um, it it's more on an inf information campaign addressing the grassroots um, level. And we also are uh, we have also actively participated in um, in streamlining the indigenous permitting process. Um, we have lobbied uh, with the NCIP on how we can help our developers get the consent of our indigenous community. So we are trying to cover a lot of things and of course the government cannot do it alone. So we are providing this set of policies and frameworks from which our developers, since our development, uh, power generation development is highly or privately uh, in the hands of the private sector. Um, um, just like I said in, our, in my slides um, earlier, we are very optimistic with this uh, the risking um, project. Uh, Shigeru here is working very hard in helping us. Um, we, we really are very optimistic that we, maybe within this year or next year, we can finally implement those uh, the, the facility so that at least 481 megawatts of geothermal capacity will be um, realized within, what, um, five years, maybe? So we, we have a lot of work to do still. <laughs> yes, thank you. Did you want it? Okay, we'll go back to the crowd. Uh, uh, there's a question at the back. Hello, uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm Xin from uh, ADB, uh, working on the environment. So I have a question for uh, Hazel and also for Phil. Uh, to, I hope you can elaborate based on your uh, presentation. So Hazel said, mentioned that uh, one of the difficulties is uh, access to the grid for geothermal. But, uh, you know, the other renewable energy uh, like solar and the wind, they have similar difficulty due to their intimate, uh, intimacy. 
um, yeah, intimacy in, in generation, but which doesn't seem to the case, seem to be the case for a geosomal. So I, I would like to hear more. And then secondly, also the typical uh, temperature range for geosomal resources in your country. So we'd like to know a little bit. Uh, and the question for Phil is, in your presentation, you mentioned in, uh, in New Zealand that after utilizing the geothermal, for example, the steam pad, and then you discharge the remaining still hot water with uh, rich in mineral that cause you know, pollution problem in the river, in the water body. Actually, there's also thermal pollution that you increase temperature probably quite uh, drastically than the, you know, discharge from normal uh, thermal power plant. So that ha has a lot of uh, impact on aquatic system, fishery, etc. So how has uh, New Zealand addressed this uh, problem that you can share you know, to other uh, you know, still nascent in geothermal uh, countries? Thank you. And, and also about the temperature range of your typical geothermal resources in your country. Thank you. Okay, thank you for those questions. Um, who would like to go first? Hey. Yeah, um, so, hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. So I think the, the question to us is in terms of how uh, what, 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 how unique it is a challenge for, for the grid. Uh, the access to the grid. Access yeah. to the grid for, for local developers. Uh, for, for geothermal. For geothermal, um, I like other RD, I think, um, um, especially in the Philippines, like I've mentioned before, um, it's the topography of, uh, uh, of the of the Philippines um, and most of the geothermal resource are on the mountainous area. So unlike other RE's we're in um, uh, geothermal, you have to place your power plant uh, on the actual site. It's really project specific. Um, it could be it could be in an island, um, but but in a mountainous area. Um, and then um, the you, you can have a really good resource in a certain area, but the existing grid lines are far. So it, um, it, you, you can actually pass your, your business case on the resource alone, but when you uh, factor in the constructability, the transmission line would, would go 50 um, more um, kilometers plus um, given the existing grid lines of the, of, uh, of the country. Uh, thanks. And the um, I think there's temperature a range? temperature um, yeah. around 200 degree on average. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm looking at our um, <laughs> technical, SME. Technical people <laughs> down there. <laughs> I'm taking the cue. Uh, okay, Phil. So your questions was on the pollution aspects, uh, discharging to the river and uh, the temperature range. Uh, so as, as I um, touched on the uh, the early ex, um, development at uh, Wairaki, which is uh, the longest uh, running station that's been in New Zealand, um, all of the fluid um, produced from the reservoir was was um, discharged into the river, and and as well as the thermal pollution that you touched on, it was uh, there was also a lot of um, problem because of the silica, um, boron, various other um, uh, chemicals. So. Um, Progressively over time, that's actually been um, uh, stopped so that all of the, the fluid from Wairaki is now re-injected back into the reservoir. So, so what it does is um, it returns the fluid into the ground basically to, uh, to warm back up again so it, it becomes a, a, a closed loop. So that, that gets rid of the, um, um, the environmental uh, pollution. Um, we've also seen a reduction in the amount of heat which is put into local rivers. Um, there's, there's, um, I was actually uh, just a few days ago looking at the uh, the resource consent that's been um, issued for one of the new power stations, that the replacement for Wairaki, and there are very strict limits put on um, the developer by council in terms of the amount of temperature rise that you can have in the river um, because of the um, cumulative impact of all of the other things that are happening in the river as well as well so the whole of that river system is actually considered and and then the particular impact of of one development on it so it's driven uh, developers uh, more towards um, using cooling towers for example 
rather than uh, using um, water from the river for cooling for the stations. And um, I touched on the, the consenting approach where when a developer goes to council to get um, approval, the approval is for the amount of fluid that can be taken and returned to the reservoir. It's not saying the development is for 50 megawatts or 80 megawatts, it's, it's that amount of fluid. And I think that what that has done is it's driven the developers to be very efficient in the way that they actually use the resource. So, um, you know, a re recent example um, uh, at a, a place called Tohara, which is just out of, um, out of Taupo in, in uh, central North Island, um, Contact Energy have just commissioned um, 174 megawatt um, triple flash um, station, which is probably one of the most efficient plants that there is anywhere in the world. Um, and, and I've been fortunate enough to be actually working um, alongside the contact team as, as they've gone through the development. And it's several times through that, they've actually gone back to the machine supplier and said, can we get a bit more out of this thing? So they've actually uprated it for the same amount of fluid that they're actually using. So, so the, the way that you actually set up your approvals often drives the developers to do the right things. Uh, temperature resources um, of, of the resources, um, Mark, mid 200s, up to three, yeah, 320. So Tahara is up, up um, over 300 degrees. Okay. okay, yeah, so yeah, thanks for that, Phil. And we'll, we'll have the last question. I don't want to keep anyone uh, for, um, from lunch. So the last question, yeah, thanks. Introduce yourself. And uh... My name is Herbert Lubis from Indonesia. I'm a practitioner of uh, energy, renewable energy, clean energy. I only have one uh, question. When I was a small boy, I traveled to our geothermal site in Sarula and also in the south of Sarula in Sumatra Island, and also to our friend here from Papua New Guinea, that there, <laughs> there, there are potential of, I'm not so sure, gold in the, you know, uh, brine or, you know, yeah. nearby area. Please explain, how can we uh, utilize or, you know, explore this uh, potential for the future of uh, sustainable geothermal development? Thank you. Okay, thank you for that question. It's a good question and it's uh, having a lot of attention lately. So shall I, uh, Ellen, do you wanna uh, respond to that? <laughs> Thanks, uh, Herbert, for the questions. Yes, that's exactly what we are going to do in the future, but not to the gold yet. <laughs> uh, we did uh, analysis on our brain. It has content of the lithium, uh, silica, of course, and boron as well as the gold. So we did analysis, we sent the sample to New Zealand, <laughs> to US, to China, to France, to analysis, that's kind of confirmation, the content of the brine. You see the precious metals, yes, it's confirmed it's gold there. Uh, however, to uh, extract that gold from the brine, it's not economical yet for the current technology, but we are going to do to extract the lithium for its time being. So we get the technology uh, from uh, US. We uh, have some uh, technical assistance as well from ADB to do that. So hopefully by this year or next year, we'll be able to materialize that. We extract lithium because the needs are there for lithium because a lot of batteries, uh, batteries manufacturers in around this region as well will be in Indonesia. So there'll be a lot of requirement in lithium. So we'll do that in lithium first. Maybe in the next feature and my presentation is gold is there, but not economical yet. Thank you. Hey, thanks for that. Yeah, please you stand up. You've got the last word. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Ronald Miketa. I'm the managing director for the National Energy Authority. We are regulated uh, specifically on the geothermal. Papua New Guinea is right south of Philippines. We sell and border with Indonesia, yet we had to develop a large scale geothermal. And uh, we have some of the best reservoirs compared to um, our neighbors. 
from one source, you can do up to 250 megawatts. So we had a very good friend, uh, Fortescue Future Industries, who, who was fishing around, um, came to our beautiful paradise and said, hey, why not we go into bed on this one? Let's sign up a couple of agreements, um, bring it up to COP28, have all the necessary approvals, the government commitment, and then they said, oh, we can do it. You know, we need some uh, sort of government interventions or oh, de risk the profile, uh, need sub, you know, collaboration in the financing as well. So th there are some challenges where we got private investors coming in, want to do things, and then they run away to criminal process, yeah? or either hang in balance. So th th those are the challenges we have. Uh, our um, challenge, especially in, in PNG, is access, access to those resources. So given, given the island state, we have more than 600 islands, probably in the small island states uh, compared to, let's say, uh, Philippines or Indonesia. But uh, our potential on geothermal, we have up to almost uh, more than 30 gigawatt uh, in, in some of those uh, areas. And uh, our challenge is bringing in investors who, who are serious, who want to come in and sign up. Uh, and then run away, uh, uh, or not run away, but whatever the vision it is. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how do we de-risk and, and bring it up to a uh, bankable that uh, we give uh, confidence to um, you know, renewable development in the space? And I believe geothermal coexists with you know, scalability of the project. You cannot do small uh, geothermal project or standalone. That should be scalable. And, yeah, and FFI was trying to tie it down to hydrogen products and you know, the export hydrogen or green hydrogen, green ammonia. But then we're still in the R&D states for hydrogen you know, shipping and all, all the uh, technology that exists today. So how, how do we um, collaborate in the spaces in the region as uh, ASF and then promote uh, this very important uh, resource? Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for that, that last question. It's quite a, quite a, a long one, a girly one. And lucky we have Peter here from <laughs> Papua New Guinea the Energy uh, team there. So he'll be able to engage with you on, on that. Um, and we also have EDC here, potential uh, developer and investor in uh, Papua New Guinea as well. Um, so did anyone want to take that last question? Any comments? Okay. Okay, please. So if I can just uh, add a comment, that's a very good comment. As the chair of the Asia Pacific Geothermal Association, which is represented by Australia, Indonesia, Japan, and, and the other uh, Asian countries, we actually had a webinar uh, a couple of years ago, and we invited someone from Papua New Guinea to present the geothermal potential there. You have a 50 megawatt uh, geothermal plant operating in the um, Lihir, Lihir Gold, right? There are other geothermal prospects that are very good uh, in, in the other islands. Unfortunately, I think one, one of the biggest um, challenges there in Papua New Guinea is the market. So although you have very good geothermal resources, we need to, to look at how the, the, the projects can be economically uh, developed, so. Thank you, yeah, thanks for that. So it looks like we're losing people to lunch already, so. Uh... So we'll wrap it up here and I uh, just want to thank all the speakers for their time today and their presentations. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot.